A reading from the book of Jonah. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to her the message that I tell you. So Jonah rose and set out for Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah went a day's journey into the city and called out, In forty days Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least. The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, stripped off his clothes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he cried out and issued a decree in Nineveh, on the authority of the kings and the nobles, saying, By the decree of the king and his nobles, let no man or beast, no herd or flock taste anything. Let them not graze or drink water. But let man and beast be covered in sackcloth, and let them call out with fervor to God. Let everyone forsake his evil way and the violence that he plans to do towards others. Who knows? God may relent and turn from his fierce anger, so that we may not perish. When God examined their deeds, how they forsook, forsake evil way, He renounced the disaster he had said that he would do to them, and he did not carry it out. The word of the Lord. So we're continuing with uh, Jonah. And remember I said there's two halves to Jonah. The first half is um, uh, when he refuses to go. And he's like the um, younger prodigal son who just wants to do what he wants to do. The second half, which we're in today, is where he actually is obedient to God, sort of. Um, but the question is, uh, really, that's the whole, his message is about repenting. And why do people repent? Jonah did repent when he came out of the belly of the uh, fish and washed ashore. He repented and he did what God wanted. He went to Nineveh. He traveled into the city, began to preach. In 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown. And to Jonah's shock, the people um, neither laughed at him nor beat him up. And he would have been considered an enemy. In fact, the whole city responded. And the Hebrew word for repent, uh, shub, turn, occurs four times in two verses. Um, That's a striking central message. Uh, repent, turn. And against all expectations, this powerful and very violent city uh, put on sackcloth and ashes. Um, Just where sackcloth and ashes come from, we really don't know. They're so ancient, we don't know. Ashes are always a sign of mourning. But it said they did so from the greatest to the least, uh, from the top to the bottom of the spectrum. even their herds. And really, how could this have happened? Well, historians point out that at the same time that Jonah's mission was, Assyria Assyria had experienced a series of famine and plagues and revolts and eclipse, all they thought were as bad omens for far worse things coming. So some have argued that God kind of prepared the ground for Jonah with these series of calamities that happened to Assyria. So maybe, uh, I mean, there's no historical record other than the Hebrew Testament, but um, this state of affairs would have made the rulers and the subject unusually attuned to a message of a visiting prophet. Um, so there are kind of some social explana- sociological explanations why Nineveh may have suddenly uh, repented. And uh, the story is just on the power of repenting. That's the story of Jonah in this part. And like there's a story of um, in 1907, this Korean priest, uh, in 1907, the Koreans always had this um, uh, anger towards the Japanese who abused them. Um, And in 1907, this priest gives this scathing homily to the Koreans 
to his own people, saying, you hold such bitterness and anger. You need to repent. You know, even though you're the victims, you shouldn't carry around this much anger. He asks everybody to start this repent for the anger that they have towards the Japanese. And this re really strange miracle happened. People actually started to beg for repentance, but then also had kind of this personal conversion. So people who st stole things returned it. People that were angry at each other uh, reconciled. And amazingly, um, in one year, the parish doubled in size. And the odd part is, like I always think that, you know, if we are truly a repentant people and sorry for our sins and tried to make up, <laughs> maybe that would create this great evangelization. If we're so honest about our own sins, maybe good people would be attracted to us. Um, and this um, Notre Dame sociologist um, made this huge comment on modern uh, morality, that modern morality today really doesn't bring much room for repentance. Um, it's this theology of I am blessed, or God loves me, or in a word, their whole morality is simply to be kind. But nowhere do you have this kind of um, examination of conscience that seems to be missing from a uh, modern version of Christianity. It's more God loves me and I'll just be nice to other people. But if you're Christian, um, they would say, well, there's no need to repent because God loves me. Repenting is what those other non-Christians and Canadians, that's what they should be doing. Um, but like the Jonah story, um, maybe the part of the true message of God is not just that we're loved, but God is calling us to a deeper conversion and asking us to convert the world. But the only way we can achieve a deeper conversion is by taking repentance very serious. And there's obviously this long history of uh, not asking other people to repent, but first ourselves repenting. And <clears throat> like um, Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah, uh, wasn't uh, Rosh Hashanah was, uh, Yom Kippur was just, uh, wasn't that last Tuesday? So just to explain those Jewish um, feasts a little bit. So Rosh Hashanah literally means uh, the head of the year, or uh, it's a Jewish New Year. And it's a biblical name for the holiday where uh, it's called the Day of Shouting or the Day of Blasting because they blow the shofar, the ram's horn. The shofar is to remind God, you promised to bring us the Lamb of God. But it's the first of the Jewish high holidays, and traditionally, it's, uh, it's the anniversary of when God created Adam and Eve. And then the festival ends, um, in this liturgical period, with Yom Kippur, and the reading of the story of Jonah. So in Jewish synagogues last Tuesday, they would have read the uh, whole story of Jonah. And this rabbi, I, uh, he lays out five reasons why Jews read um, the story of Jonah on Yom Kippur. And the first is just Jonah's theme of repentance. Like Jonah, God is always revealing our sins to us. And so the Midrash says, Israel said to God, master of the universe, if we repent, will you accept it? God responded, I would accept the repentance of the people of Nineveh. Why not yours? So Jonah reminds them, if God for, for, could forgive the Ninevites, of course God will forgive us if we're truly sorry for our sins. So they read the Jonah story. The second, uh, they read the Jonah, Jonah story to say God's love is, uh, his mercy is everlasting. And it's not nailed down to one people. So great theme to remember. The other is that the Jonah story is a reminder that the entire world and its natural forces are at God's hands. And God uses the natural world to bring us to, to repentance. So in the Jonah story, you have the wind, the storm, um, the Kiganyon plant, 
the sea, the great fish are all vehicles of God trying to urge us to a greater conversion. All these natural things that are God's will and hand, God uses to bring about a deeper conversion for us. Um, and then according to the Mishnah, Yom Kippur is a time of prayer for conversion. The same way in the belly of the fish, Jonah uh, had this prayer that converted him. Not only is it a time of penance, but a time of prayer praying that we can be converted. And the fifth reason, I think this is, uh, we'll get into this more next week. Are Jews faithful to the mission that God gave them? So in the book of Jonah, there's always this uh, tension between the great city of Nineveh and the small town of Tarshish, the land or the sea, compassion or destination, uh, up or down, embracing God or evading God embracing the mission or uh, evading the mission, the desire for truth or being obtuse. Um, and Jonah is read on Yom Kippur as this reflection, if Jews have been f uh, faithful to their mission to convert the world, or have been they been obtuse like Jonah? And if you think about it, we do this in the Catholic Church. We have these time periods, likewise, of begging God for a deeper conversion. That's what Lent is. Um, and in Lent, we spend 40 days, we start with ashes. I love this, uh, this ancient symbol that we're, we're um, begging God for a deeper conversion. So um, like we do this in Lent, but what I really like in Lent, um, and unfortunately a lot of people don't know this, but um, Lent is really about conversion, especially uh, welcoming people into the Catholic Church. We show them what it means to be religious by us begging for a deeper conversion. And so um, during Lent, we have the three scrutinies. It starts on the, um, I think the third, fourth, and fifth Sundays of Lent. And the scrutinies is you're begging God to send the Holy Spirit so that we can scrutinize our own lives and see our sins. So the first scrutiny, I mean, hopefully everybody knows this, the first scrutiny is for the first week you pray that you can see your own personal sins. The second week you pray that you can see our social sins. Social sins does not mean like sins of being sociable. Social <laughs> sins um, means sins that we commit as a group as a church, as a parish, as uh, the United States. Um, and this one's really hard for a lot of people because I think a lot of people, are, Americans are so individualistic. Um, I think a lot of people, every year I mention social sins, people say, well, that's not my fault. Um, <laughs> but I use this example where this, I really like this couple in McCall. They, they were from Manhattan Beach, but they had a cabin in McCall, and we just hit it off. Loved them, and um, apparently they had some money because they belonged to this country club in Manhattan Beach, and they had mentioned that the country club doesn't allow blacks. And I said, well, but you're a member of the country club. And they said, but we're not prejudiced. <laughs> and I said, but you're a member of the country club. <laughs> And I just remember when they're fighting me and saying, but we're not prejudiced, but you're a member of the country club. And like suddenly she gets it and she says, oh, I see what you're saying. <laughs> uh, that yes, we're not prejudiced, but we're a member of the club. And we're responsible partly, not completely, for the uh, sins of the club. And I hate to say this, the sins of the Catholic Church, you can't say, well, that's what the bishops did. You're a Catholic, and it, uh, you're a member of the club. The sins of the Catholic Church, God will judge us. So, like, I, I know, does that make any sense? Anybody want to fight me on that? <laughs> what is the option, then, leaving the church? Not leaving the church, but, like, today is the feast day of St. Teresa of, uh, Teresa of uh, Avila. She was in a time period of great uh, corruption, the Spanish Inquisition. 
And we'd say her, St. Ignatius, and St. John the Cross, they saved the Catholic Church. The Spanish Inquisition was harshly going to make sure people were Orthodox. And they couldn't see that that was killing the church, not saving it. Um, and so Teresa of Avila, it's not like she left the Catholic Church, but she reformed it from within. Um, so if you're a member of the church, if that's part of our sins, we have to be part of the um, recovery, not leave the church. And look, there were sins, and um, Luther leaves the Catholic Church, right, and starts his own church, but he doesn't reform it. Uh, pretty soon, they have their own problems. Okay, I have a question. I noticed, because your hand was waving. <laughs> No, because not you don't just because the priests aren't following the. And that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying you need to follow law. I'm saying you're responsible for the sins of the church. Maybe some laws must be broken to be moral. So it's not about following law. It's just about morality. Did I lose people on that? I did. Because how do you, what if the law is unjust? And you know then you're morally obligated to protest against the law. Yes, and you demand more. That's what Teresa of Avila did. For myself, I feel like I don't, I still exist, confess, whatever. I don't pray for priests. Oh, she's going to go to confession. <laughs> we have a responsibility as laity to pray for the priests and to support the priests. And I, as a, I will say that I don't do it enough. So that's how I feel is part of my social sin. I'm so, not doing my part. So she said part of her social sin is that she doesn't pray for the priests. But yeah. even more than that, yeah. it does say in the Vatican II documents that the laity are morally obligated to give their insights and knowledge to the bishops. Um, rather than just say, well, you know, that's the bishops. And stop saying priests, the bishops. Um, um, no, they allowed it. They did the cover-up. I didn't. Uh, they allowed it. But, yeah, the laity can say, well, then, like, I, the laity can, you know, a lot of reasons this happened. The laity have to kind of demand that their bishops reform the church. That's even the Vatican II documents. Rob? So Rob and Julie have been involved in youth ministry since the time of Noah. Um, <laughs> and with the scandal, if they would have left, then they would have, if they would have left the Catholic Church, then they just couldn't witness to the next generation. And no offense, I think leaving the Catholic Church is both cowardice and irresponsible. That's when the church needs you. Um, when they had that scandal, and I. I might have this wrong, but the Pope was saying did some kind of a commission that they were going to look into the priests and the bishops to kind of cover it up. But as they got into it, the Pope dissolved that. But as a lay person, how could we hold like the bishop and the Pope feet to the fire that they don't cover up all the scandal and that they expose it and people, you know, like some bishops, I guess, move priests around so that they wouldn't. You know, well, okay, so that's kind of, she said, well, how can we hold the bishops accountable? I just think you have to hold the bishops accountable with saying, we want to demand, we don't want this cover-up. Uh, like, I just think that goes the will of the people. If enough people speak up, they change. Yeah, well, I'm not about to walk up to the Pope and say, you're wrong. You, you have well, you could just mission, start with your bishop. And now you like a, it as even, a even, even bishop... Them. Uh, Baron said, you're, you're morally obligated to write your bishops and say you're upset with this. They have to know that they, more courage is demanded from them. Um, was talking about the law. There's actually a canon code. It's called, I think it's 212, because it used to be part of my address, that you can do this. 
Yes, that is actually part of canon law, part of the Vatican II documents. You have a moral obligation to try and correct the, the church when it's wrong. Now, don't want to spend too much time on the scandal bit. Just saying that, um, just think about this. In the Catholic Church, we have this obligation of social sins that we're responsible for what our country and our church does. You know who didn't have that concept? Jonah. Jonah, really, if you look in the first part, he, he, whatever his country did, whatever prejudice that they had towards non-Jews, Jonah was a bigot towards us Gentiles. Nor did he think he had an obligation to change. Where the, so he had no sense of the social sin. Now, there's a third one, uh, cosmic sin. I don't really want to get into that because we'll be going down that road explaining it, and I want to kind of stick with Jonah. But my only point is, just like the Jews in Yom Kippur, like the point of the book of Jonah, we're always in need of repentance, not just the pagans and the Canadians. We're in charge of that. And like I love the fact that, um, I know it's mocked, but reconciliation really is a very healthy thing. We teach our kids to always examine and be sorry for their sins. But changing the story a little bit. Um, so... You know, the second graders made a pledge this Sunday to learn everything about the Eucharist and reconciliation. And one kid clearly has a very sensitive conscience, was kind of freaking out. And I love this where he said to his mother, he's kind of freaking out. And I said to his mother, well, that's kind of good that he's that conscious. And so he said to his mother, and I like this line, Mom, I've done things. <laughs> he's... He's in second grade. Um, <laughs> I can, I shouldn't tell you, but I can tell you what every second grader confesses. They've lied to their parents and they fought with their brothers and sisters. <laughs> but it's good that you try and make them with repentance. You want a deeper and deeper conversion. Um, so think about this. What was, did Jonah preach? All he preached was repentance. Now, in part one of the Jonah story, all he wanted to preach, all he, he wanted to preach, was really how bad pagans are. And this national arrogance that Jerusalem, sorry, Israel could do no wrong. You know that because in Kings, he opposes the true prophets. And in the book of uh, Kings, he's opposing Amos. And now anything the nation does is right. He has no sense of social sin. And repentance is for other people. In part two, Jonah doesn't select his preaching. God gives him this simple message. And technically, he, was start, um, he started to preach what God wanted. But then we're going to find out next week. It was never really in his heart. Um, in part one, he only preached politics. In part two, well, he does preach repentance and justice. So in one sense, he preached social reform, but it's not in his heart. Um, he didn't want the Ninevites to reform. He wanted the Ninevites destroyed. And the word overturned, when he said in 40 days they'll be overturned, that could mean, it's a, it's a vague term, it could mean destroyed or converted. Um, so like Jonah, uh, I, I just give him credit because in part one, he preached what would have been popular, even when he goes against the prophet Amos. In part two, he does preach what the people needed to hear. And I just mentioned that because um, there's all this marketing about preaching that you guys probably don't know, but like um, when I was at St. Mark's, I discovered this. There's this company that, uh, it was $15,000, but that was several years ago, that you can pay this marketing company that specializes in starting new churches. And they do this demographic study on what people want to hear. And then they'll tell you, let's say you're starting a church, and they'll tell you, this is how and what you need to preach. To Yeah, but think about it. You're paying this marketing company. And the odd part is, by their own advertising, it seems to work. You're not really preaching what God wants. 
You're preaching what will make you popular. That's what Jonah did in part one. Part two, he goes to Nineveh and give him cur cur credit for the courage. He, uh, he easy, I, I mentioned this before, that would be like a Jew, Jewish rabbi going to Nazi Germany and preaching they're going to be destroyed. It really was a death sentence. And um, uh, Jonah, surprisingly, isn't harassed or laughed at or persecuted. They actually convert, was re, uh, reasons. But he preaches what God wants, and what he preaches is justice. Um, and while it says they, quote unquote, believed in God in verse 5, there's really no indication that the Ninevites came into this covenant relationship with the God of Israel. The word the Ninevites use is the word God in Hebrew, Elohim. Now, that just means God. Elohim means God. Um, rather than the personal covenant name of God, Yahweh. Use Yahweh when you have a moral obligation. You're in a religious relationship. If your God in the general term is the term Elohim, does that make sense or did I lose people? So uh, when it says you shall not take Yahweh's name in vain, Yahweh's name is not God. <laughs> Technically, Elohim is a job description. But the sailors who are pagans, they actually use the word Yahweh. The Ninevites use the weaker term Elohim, which just means God. The contrast is when the sailors cry out Yahweh, they address it to God and they make an oath. They commit themselves to Yahweh. Um, there's no mention of the re re uh, residents of Nineveh forsaking their gods or idols. Uh, they didn't offer sacrifice, which is this moral obligation to Yahweh. Um, and that's just kind of odd. So they do... Uh, cry out to God, but kind of this general term. And that's why most commentators would agree that Jonah really didn't convert the Ninevites. They repented, but they didn't convert. Do you see the difference? Okay, so they convent, um, they repented, but they didn't convert. And the king of Nineveh understood that God was saying that each citizen of the city, not just the king, but each citizen must, quote, forsake his evil ways and the violence he plans towards others. Um, Nineveh was uh, blatantly accused of committing injustice. And the call to repentance of, uh, against injustice fits well with the message of other biblical prophets. Um, so it makes you kind of think, well, do we preach repentance or conversion? Repentance is a low bar. Conversion is the high bar. Um, being converted to justice is the high bar. Um, as I said, the modern morality is basically be kind. But there's no justice in being kind. Does that make sense? Um, being polite doesn't create justice. Or what's very popular in American Christianity is what's called the gospel of prosperity. Do you guys know what the gospel of prosperity is? Okay, gospel prosperity is very popular among the televangelists, Joel Olstein, um, Pat Robertson, that if you pray to God, God is going to bless your checkbook. Um, <laughs> God will give you that new truck. Um, actually, just to be clear, the Catholic Church really preaches the opposite. If you pray to God, God's going to demand a sacrifice. Uh, he'll demand a covenant, demands everything. It's not about getting something from God. It's about giving your whole selves to God. And you don't get a truck back. You get God back. <laughs> no, you get a deeper relationship with God. You don't get a, a, a bigger checkbook. But think about this. The gospel of prosperity that is so popular with televangelists, um, it preaches no justice. There's no justice. It's just that your checkbook will get bigger. Like the Ninevites, the gospel of prosperity doesn't demand any real commitment to God or changing your behavior, just to avoid destruction. Um, and the weird part is, Jonah really loved preaching the wrath of God. Um, now, 
I know it sounds strange. People don't like the phrase wrath of God, but what is the wrath of God? And I'm going to take this from um, the book of Koheleth, because I like it. And Koheleth mentions the wrath of God. Now, when you hear the wrath of God, you kind of think, oh, like an angry Irish woman screaming at you. <laughs> um, the wrath of God uh, in Koheleth is, um, he uses the example of a shepherd, and the shepherd's hook has um, both the curve to pull you like if you're a sheep, to pull you in, or the shepherd's hook has on the bottom, it has a point, and the point is called a goad, and the shepherd, just to move the sheep along a little bit more, let's say you're a fluffy sheep, um, <laughs> the shepherd could poke the, the sheep, um, and it's a little bit of pain, but it gets them moving in the right direction. The wrath of, okay, if the shepherd loves the sheep, it either pulls or goads it. The wrath of God is, if the sheep really is angry with God or the shepherd for all this, the wrath of God is saying, fine, I'll leave you alone. Let's see where you end up on your own. The wrath of God is when God leaves us alone. Uh, does that make sense? Um, so it's a huge difference. But Jonah... Boy, this sounds kind of strange. His message is not pure because he's really, the wrath of God for him is God hates you people. <laughs> and he enjoys that message. Now, just technically, nowhere in the Bible does it say that God doesn't get angry with injustice. It God just says God is slow to anger. Um, sometimes anger at injustice is the best response. If you see cruelty and injustice in the world and you're not moved, something is wrong with you. To work against social justice or to work against injustice and to call people to repentance, theologically, that is what God does. Um, Martin Luther King didn't make a mistake uh, of separating social justice from God's judgment. So in his letter from a Birmingham jail, he responds to the question, how could he advocate civil disobedience, the breaking of some laws uh, in the case of racial segregation? And he answers that some laws are unjust. One has a legal and moral responsibility to obey just laws. Conversely, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. And I agree with St. Augustine, who said the same thing that, quote, an unjust law is no law at all. What's the difference between the two? How do you determine what's just and unjust? A just law is um, ma a man-made, sorry, a just law is a man-made code that squares with God's moral law. An unjust law is one that is out of harmony with the moral law of God. Um, so here there's no separation between working for justice in a society and declaring God's displeasure with injustice. So in Martin Luther King's uh, I Have a Dream speech, he didn't appeal to modern secularism. He didn't say, well, all should be free to find their own meaning and moral truths. Rather, he quotes scripture where he says, let God's justice roll down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. That's from Amos. Um, I do have to give Jonah credit. He did preach against injustice. And no offense, that's a lot more than most bishops did. And I mean, I mentioned this from the pulpit. It drives me up the wall when you have one scandal after another in the Catholic Church and bishops say, well... We've got to pause and pray about this. Um, no, in the face of injustice and cruelty and child abuse, um, pause and more prayers is not what I want to hear. I want to hear you're going to do something. Um, so anger and injustice may be the right moral response. Saying, well, we'll just have more prayers is not. Um, but the problem is, um, is it love of preaching God's anger more than justice is wrong. Um, Jonah loves preaching God's anger. And when God doesn't destroy the city, Jonah is upset. Now, think about this. That makes, why, why is he upset? Um, do artists get upset when people praise their work? 
Do musicians get really upset if you give them a standing ovation? Jonah's message was successful. So what's his problem? His problem is that he couldn't in, really, he, all he wanted was anger. His, his heart was not that injustice had stopped or people repented. His problem is that he enjoyed anger. He wanted God to destroy the people. And you guys know the story of Maria Goretti? Okay, that's a no. Um, that's a, uh, Marie Goretti, just, she was this um, little girl, Italian, and uh, her family was very, very poor. They kind of shared this house with this other family. Um, and um, there was, a, I think he was 17. His name was Alejandro. Uh, she comes home, and he tries to rape her. And because she resists, he stabs her. And then um, she's... Um, I, I should get the full story. I'm just going off memory. But the doctor called, the doctor is there, and the doctor says there's nothing uh, he can do. And at one point he says, um, uh, oh, well, anyhow, Marie Goretti, her dying worry was really not about her dying, but her dying worry is what would happen to Alejandro? What if he would burn in hell? So Alejandro gets sentenced, he's sentenced to jail. This priest would go by um, and try and talk to Alejandro, and he would spit on the priest, he would yell at the priest, well, peed on the priest once. Um, and so uh, for a couple years, he was just this angry, angry person. But he has this dream where Maria Gretti comes, and um, she's in this garden. And after the dream, she talks to him, he has this conversion because of the dream. He goes to confession, spends his years in jail, and when he gets out of jail, he really is this not only repented, but converted. And he takes a job with these Franciscan brothers as a gardener, and one week after he's um, out of jail, he goes to Maria Gretti's mother. Now, to be honest, I know I'm strange. Yes, I like Maria Gretti, but I love her mother because he knocks on the door of Maria Goretti's house and her mother's answered. And um, he begs forgiveness for what he had done. And Maria Goretti's mother says, Maria forgave you, God forgave you, I forgave you. The only question I have is, why did it take you so long? <laughs> um, and the story goes is that every Sunday, Alejandro would escort Maria Goretti Goretti's mother to Mass, that um, Marie Goretti's sister um, becomes a nun and takes Alejandro's name as part of her religious. He actually became a brother and a son to the mother. Um, and when Maria Goretti is pronounced a saint, Alejandro is right next to his mother. They're inseparable. Um, he adopted her as his mother and she adopted him as her son. The one who killed her son her, sorry, her daughter trying to rape her. Now, I just mentioned that story because it's not only a story of repentance, but conversion. And the real hero, I think, is the mother who was so thrilled that Alejandro has a conversion. The opposite of that is Jonah. Jonah, um, why is he upset? Because he wanted destruction. He didn't want conversion. Even though the Ninevites uh, knew that forgiveness was possible, um, his main thrust of his preaching was really destruction. Jonah's heart was not set on justice. It enjoyed the preaching of wrath. Um, so in the summary of the text, his sermon is not, in 40 days, Nineveh, Nineveh might be overthrown. It's 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown. As I said, technically the word overthrown could mean conversion as well. But Jonah enthusiastically wanted one interpretation, and that was destruction. Unlike Mary Grady's mother, she, he, didn't, he didn't want his enemies converted. He wanted them destroyed. He enjoyed the preaching of hatred. So he couldn't wait till the hammer fell on them. So I know this is kind of strange, but I have met several priests who kind of enjoy preaching the anger of God. Um, 
And the odd part to me, those who preach the anger of God um, usually um, they disguise it as preaching justice, but they're thrilled by anger. And I have to tell you, the one with, who always preaches such anger, just knowing a lot of these priests, they have a lot of skeletons in their closet. I think they want to keep everybody, like all their anger is towards the people when it should be towards them, themselves. And God responds to the Ninevites with mercy. So it says, when God examined their deeds, how they forsook, forsook their evil ways, he renounced the disaster he had said that he would do to them and did not carry it out. And this is what plunges Jonah into the depths of despair and disappointment with God, um, that he showed mercy. Now, the real twist to me is at the very opening of um, the story of Jonah, it says, the word of Jonah came, the, the word of God came to Jonah, the son of Amity. Um, and so there's something really funny about that because the Jonah story is also the story of kind of self-blinding religion. That Jonah, yes, he's religious, but he's obtuse and self-righteous, and he doesn't see himself as being obtuse and self-righteous. Um, and the twist is, when it says, Jonah, the son of Amity, um, the word emet, it's actually the same word, uh, the word emet in Hebrew means truth. So he's the son of truth. But the irony is this, if your identity is caught up with being brave, it's going to be really hard for you to admit being cowardice. If your identity is caught up with being smart, then it's going to be really hard for you to admit when you're stupid. If your identity is caught up with being religious, it might be very hard for you to be honest about sin. Jonah, the son of truth, he can't accept truth. He's a phony in part one. He's a phony religious part. And then in the second part, he's like the older brother who's upset that the younger brother gets forgiven. And he can't see the truth that he's the one who has problems with compassion, which is what he needed in part one. Um, so, like, getting back to this, it always seems the priests who have a uh, problem uh, with loving preaching anger, they also have a problem with truth. I, I don't know why, it's just always true. Like, uh, there's this kid who, um, the, I might as well tell this. Uh, there's this kid um, who, his name is Emmett, go, used to go to this parish, and I just, I liked his name because his name means truth in Hebrew, right? He doesn't know that, but kids these days. <laughs> don't even start me on refusing to learn their Hebrew. Um, but like, the thing about it is, he's a, he, well, he doesn't go here anymore, but he's, he was a good kid. And not only that, like, he was a like, um, fun-loving, but like, I always thought his name Emmett really <coughs> felt true because he was just so forthright in things. And like um, when he got confirmed, he took the name Raphael, who's an angel. And it's an angel of healing and lovers. So I saw him and I said, oh, Emmett, why'd you take the name Raphael? And he says, well, you know, all during junior high and high school, friends would come to me with their problems. And friends would come to me if they had a problem with uh, their girlfriends, and I would always help them with their advice. And he said, I really think I'm uh, meant to help heal people. Well, don't you love that self-awareness? <laughs> um, so Emmett, um, he goes to confession to this priest. And in the confession, he mentions to really the wrong priest. He says, well, there's, I have some doubts about some parts of um, Catholicism, which just in case you didn't know, you know we believe in a hierarchy of truths. That dogmas, you must believe. Doctrines, you should believe. Catholic teachings should inform your conscience, but they may be wrong. So like when Emmett says that, the priest could have said, well, let me help you with some of those. He didn't. The priest gets upset and says, and you shouldn't even be part of the Catholic Church. And choose him out that he should never go to. So, of course, that kind of derailed that. But knowing the priest who did that, it's the priest who has the problems, not Emmett. 
Does that make like, like yeah. the, the irony? Same thing with the Jonah story, except Jonah's now the angry priest. It's Jonah who has problems with the truth and the truth about God's mercy. So, um, and, you know, did you want to leave or? Oh, sorry. Um, is there a problem? Oh. No, Rob, I thought. <laughs> okay, so um, I don't know if we should get well, we can go a little longer um, so here's the next part where it says, uh, this is the last chapter which we'll finish up next time but God did but what God did was so terrible to Jonah that he burned with anger he prayed to Yahweh and said oh Yahweh, this is not is this not what I spoke of when I was still in my homeland, that this is why I fled in haste to Tarshish. For I knew that you were gracious and compassionate, very patient, abounding in steadfast love, and who also renounces plans for bringing destruction. Therefore, Yahweh, now please take my life from me, for death is better than life. And Yahweh said, is it good for you to burn with such anger? <laughs> Which I think is so funny. So of all the books of the Bible, Jonah is the most kind of unexpected last chapter. Most people, after hearing the story of Jonah, um, thinks that it ends with his repenting and uh, the release from the fish. You know, seriously. Most just tell, ask people about the story of Jonah and they stop at the part about the fish. A smaller number might know that no, the story goes on and Jonah preached to the Ninevites and was successful. Very few people know that um, the story, uh, they think the story ends right there with Nineveh, yet there's a final chapter. And the final chapter is, it ends with this question mark. In Assyria, if you remember, was the cruelest power on earth at the time. It's understandable that Jonah did not want to go and preach to the capital of this city. Um, yet, when he finally announces God's coming justice, there is this massive repentance. And in response, God granted a reprieve and didn't destroy the city. Now, many modern readers respond uh, with kind of a skepticism. We're qu quick to believe that... Um, Nineveh could believe in mass violence, but we have harder time believing that people actually could repent. Um, and this leads to this last chapter, which it ends on this note of, well, chapter three ends on a note of triumph, that Jonah uh, was successful. But he doesn't return to his homeland rejoicing. Instead, it takes this kind of unexpected turn and, but I love this line, listen to it. But what God did was so terrible to Jonah that he burned with anger. What's Jonah's problem? Mercy. Jonah has a problem with the mercy of God. So in verse two, uh, it, Jonah says, O Yahweh, is this not what I spoke of when you were still in my homeland? This is the first time we've heard this. Most of us knew it, but... Um, now we're led into this ongoing argument that Jonah always had with God. I knew you would do something like this. These people are evil and only change because they're scared. They didn't convert and start worshiping you. They merely promised to change, and you bestowed mercy on them. They should be destroyed. And so when Jonah cries out, Yahweh, um, that's kind of amazing. Because the first time the word Yahweh appears is in chapter 2. Now, he, Yonah, no, sorry, Yonah, Jonah cries out Yahweh. In part 1, Yahweh is what's cried out by the pagans, and they convert. In part 2, they convert and make this vow to Yahweh. In part 2, now it's Jonah crying out to Yahweh, but Jonah's making a vow really not to obey God, but a complaint against God. Now, as I said, the word Yahweh means you're in this covenant relationship with God. It's a personal one. You're obligated uh, to do what God says to do. Um, so Jonah's problem is this. 
God entered into a covenant with Yahweh to always protect and uphold his people, uh, that they'd never be destroyed by their enemies. So how at the same time can God be true to the promise of Israel and be merciful to Israel's sinners? So when Jonah cries out Yahweh, he's not being faith. When, he, when Jonah cries out Yahweh, um, it's different. Jonah is using the word Yahweh, accusing God of not being faithful to the covenant God made with Israel. God should have destroyed the Ninevites. Does that make sense? It's just this great, I love the literary device where the pagans cry out Yahweh and they pledge their life to, to Yahweh. Jonah in part two cries out Yahweh and says, you're the one who's a liar. Isn't that just uh, amazing? So in Jonah's mind, there's this contradiction between justice, the justice of God, and the love of God. How can God love Israel and Gentiles at the same time? Um, granted, it's easy to love the sailors because they're so noble, but the Ninevites were horrible people. Um, you know, now here's the amazing part. If they repented, remember, repentance is the low bar, conversion is the high bar. The people showed their willingness to repent. So at that point, shouldn't have Jonah been prepared to continue with the journey with them and lead them to a conversion? Um, how would have history been written or changed if Jonah would have gone back to the city and started to preach love? Maybe even the whole history of the Syrians would be different. But it's Jonah who gave up on the Syrians, not God. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Jonah, instead, instead of you know continuing the, to the conversion process, he's furious and he acts like a spoiled baby and sits outside the city. Um, you know, they were given a second chance by God, but uh, Jonah could have done something with that. So uh, when the same thing for us. When Christians care more about our own interests and security for the good rather than the salvation of others, we're acting like the spoiled brat Jonah. When Catholics believe that they only need to care for Catholics, they're committing the sin of Jonah. If you think that as long as God loves the United States, you don't have to love other people, you're committing the sin of Jonah. Um, then your identity is too tied in to race and nationalism. Um, Jonah had a rightful love for his country. Like, I love Israel. I'm not even from Israel. I love Ireland. I love being an American citizen. I'm very proud of being an American citizen. But there's a problem when the love goes too far. When nationalism, national pride turns into racism, when patriotism turns into imperialism, there's nothing wrong with patriotism as long as it's kept in balance with our commitment to God. So Jonah makes the mistake of uh, demanding God loves like God, God, that God should love the way and the limited amount that Jonah loves. So if you don't think this happens, it happened a couple years ago when I was on a plane on vacation. We, I was flying Delta. We changed planes in Salt Lake City and... Um, we're waiting to taxi. I'm talking to the guy next to me who's this kind of a 20-ish Mormon. And I didn't, can't remember how it started, but he started to talk about how God loves the United States. And so I said something about God loves everybody. He said, yeah, but God loves the United States more. Um, and it, honest God, I was like, you've got to be kidding. And I said, well, not everything in the United States has been right. You know, God loves everybody. He says, no, the entire world's economy depends upon our economy. So whatever we have to do to keep the economy going is morally okay because God loves us. And I'm like, you can't make this stuff up. Like, <laughs> you got to be kidding. Like, I love the United States, but I'd, not, I'd never say that imperialistically we have the right to do whatever we want because God loves us. Like, that's the Jonah position. Um, no offense, that's some Catholic's position about Catholicism. Like there's, not to get into this, there's this group that um, they kind of have a retreat for families. And I know this young father um, who was invited, they asked him if uh, they're willing to pay him to work on the retreat to do some work. 
And he was kind of interested and said, well, can my family, we'd like to come. I have kids. And they told him no, because he's not Catholic enough. Oh. And he's a really, but think about that. Suddenly now that's like national pride turning into imperialism. That there's this, some Catholics are better Catholics. Um, that's actually a dangerous sort of, um, you have a problem with God's love. That's Jonah's problem. Or um, Jonah actually misuses the Bible. Because when Jonah begins to break God and quotes God's very words uh, back to Jonah, they're from Exodus. It's a very famous passage where God reveals himself to uh, Moses. You know that he hides him in a cliff of a rock, and I just, it has this odd phrase. Um, hides him in the cliffs of rock, and uh, God says to Moses, well, you can't look on my presence, but I will let you see my hind parts, which, just have to say, I think that makes for a great bumper sticker. Um, <laughs> what he means is that, um, <laughs> no, I just imagine myself, Exodus 32, I will let you look at my hind parts. <laughs> Sorry, inappropriate. Um, uh, it just means where God has been. Um, and God, after that, says to Moses um, um, that he is compassionate and gracious and forgives the wicked. Well, that's part of what he says, and that's a part that Jonah quotes back to God. That's a problem he has with God. So he's using God against God to justify himself. But he reads the Bible selectively, ignoring certain verses where the total verse ends with God saying, not leaving the guilty unpunished. Um, he's accusing of God of this simplistic picture of God who simply loves everybody and never has any justice. And so he uses half the verse, but God, God does promise there will be justice. What Jonah is doing is kind of this great danger among Christians where it's possible to use the Bible to justify whatever anger you want or whatever prejudice you want. Um, uh, you use the Bible to confirm your own opinions. And I have to say, like, to be honest, like, this is used all the time in televangelists. Um, it's used all the time in religion. And if you don't think, by the way, we do it too. I was shocked in the seminary where the seminary professor uh, was saying, well, you have to be very careful of proof texting. And I didn't, like he's teaching a class, didn't quite know what he means. And he says, well, like, look at this. And he was taking some church documents. And he says, look at this sentence. He says, you know, pulls up a church document and uses a quote from the Bible. Well, there, it seems to nail it. And he says, except they only took half the quote. Then he shows the other half and is like, oh, the church took the quote out of context. And he says, and then the church will reverse its position. And then he'll say, when they reverse their position, they say, as we've always taught. <laughs> no, no, you didn't. You just, <laughs> they just self-corrected by saying, well, no, no, just ignore that. We, does that make any sense? So the church has this history of proof texting as well. And the problem with, um, uh, like, you, you, you use the word of God to support your own anger. Jonah does this, and it's a problem with being self-righteous. Uh, in hindsight, really, Jonah's future meltdown with God was pretty obvious in the pr prayer to the fish. Oh, sorry, the prayer when he was in the fish. Because he says at the very end of the prayers, those who cling to idol, idols forfeit, forfeit God's love. Well, in his mind, it's pagans that cling to idols, not him. And yes, of course, he needed mercy when he was in the belly of the fish, but he's not on the same level as those pagans. Jonah's self-righteousness, um, it was diminished in the fish, but not destroyed. And then he cries out, salvation comes only from the Lord. And then adds, but I'm not like those pagans. Um, so like, yeah, we do believe sin is its own punishment, but also self-righteousness is its own punishment. We have is this idea for Jonah, he's self-righteous, he's, he's converted, but not completely, and that's the point. 
he still has this self-righteousness and the self-righteousness shows itself with anger um so like the same point i'm trying to make when i meet christians that are just so angry um they always always seem to have this self-righteousness so like i think they're like jonah the anger always seems to portray a self-righteousness Jonah felt to some degree that he deserved um, mercy, but pagans didn't deserve mercy. So God quietly rebukes Jonah with this question, is it good to burn with such anger? Um, I'd say I love that line. I think it's hilarious. Because imagine like your kid throwing a tenter tantrum, and you say, is it really good that you burn with such anger? (laughs) Or the next time your wife is upset with you, Try that in an argument. Just <laughs> softly say, is it good that you burn with such anger? Um, anyhow, um, uh, so we're going to pick it up because we've got an hour um, next time. But just any questions, comments, objections? Oh, so how do you move from imperfect contrition to perfect contrition? I, I mean, I don't know, but I think there's multiple ways. I, I like Jesus mentioned alms and prayers. Um, I, I think I, I my, I have a custom point of view that if you have des- a great desire for it, God will grant you that prayer. If you really want conversion, God will grant it to you. It may take work. Well, okay, yeah, but I'm, is Jonah megalomaniac? I don't really think so, to be honest. I see a lot of, yeah. Oh, I've, I've done that. <laughs> I, I mean, no offense, I, I'm quite sure God has got some things wrong in the world. <laughs> Uh, like I do kind of, I see myself a little like Jonah, where I get mad and then I blame God. I mean, I just think if we're really honest, we're all a little self-righteous. Um, not all of us are Mother Teresa's, except for Rob. Uh, like, do you, you know what I mean? Like, we all kind of misuse religion, we misuse God, we misuse the Word of God to support our own prejudices. And we just don't want to hear any different. I think we are Jonah. The reason why the Jews read the book of Jonah and Yom Kippur when it's about repentance, we are Jonah. Maybe Jonah's, you know, more severe case, but in one measure or another, we we all have a little Jonah in us. Rob? That's true. Yeah, that's true. Even Abraham, Father Abraham, th- thought God got it wrong. Um, all the saints kind of think God gets it wrong. Maybe not to the severe case of Jonah, but really, how many people here have thought, God, you screwed up? <laughs> how, many, how many? I. Any questions of any other? So would you agree that Jonah wanted to fail in preaching to the Ninevites so he could get back what God had picked up? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Did Jonah want to fail? I don't know if he wanted to fail. I think he wanted them destroyed. Right. That's that's the only thing I know for sure from the text. But I, yeah, I guess he did want them to fail. You're right. Because he didn't want them to repent. Oh, I think he was quite forceful on the preaching of repentance because for him it meant destroy. That's a message he wanted to give. He just forgot the word overturn could also be convert. He didn't even want to consider that. So you're probably right. Okay, so next week we'll do um, the very last Jonah, and then after that we'll switch to the book of uh, Ruth. All right, goodbye.